Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast, but don't have time to listen to every one, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Welcome to the Urban Farm Podcast's Chat with an Expert series. This is a segment that we will periodically do as relevant and newsworthy topics present themselves. In each chat, we will ask an urban farming expert questions related to their area of expertise, diving more deeply into some of the important issues of our times. Tonight, I have Don Titmus. Welcome, Don. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Tonight, we are talking about permaculture, and we are going to start with week seven and move backwards because last month we talked with we started with week one and moved forward so we'll just kind of review each week once we get started so don grew up in london and at the age of 16 spent four years being trained in horticulture through an apprenticeship uh, program in a college course from there he continued landscaping in his hometown until he moved to arizona in 1981 where he worked in landscaping and then started his own business in garden design and maintenance. In 2003, he attended a permaculture design course, which was life-changing. He knew right away that this was the path that he'd been waiting for, and he later attended two additional teacher training courses. He co-founded the Phoenix Permaculture Guild, started a permaculture design company, redesigned his home site into a permaculture design destination and helped develop a thriving permaculture community in Phoenix, Arizona. He does live here in the valley with me. He has presented in five cities, worked in several states, attended classes in five states, and pretty much lives, breathes, and eats permaculture. Welcome to the, <laughs> welcome to the class tonight, Don. So do me a favor, and let's just start with a definition of permaculture for our, those people that are listening in. Wow, the toughest question first, right? Yeah, I know. So, you know, I'm going to lean back on Mollison's definition. Mollison, the, the pretty much the father of permaculture, and he worked with uh, David Holmgren, you know, back in the 70s and 80s here. So he said, permaculture is about sustainable human settlements. It's a philosophy and an approach to land use which weaves together microclimates, annuals, perennial plants, animals, soils, water, and human needs into intricately connected, productive communities. Mm -hmm. So I really love that. Yeah. I really love the way the Erefans Everything's connected. Everything weaves together. Yeah. Everything interacts with each other. And that's the piece that I love about permaculture is because it's absolutely everything mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, no, I can completely get that. When it, you know, really, when you stop to think about it, everything is weaved together. And, you know, I, I wrote this, oh, my gosh, two decades ago I wrote this. And it's a little dark, I'll warn everybody up front, but it's short. Our downfall as a species is that we're arrogant enough to think that we can control Mother Nature and, yeah. stupid, enough, and stupid enough to think it's our job. Um, <laughs> and I love what you know, our friend Toby says. I know, right? Yeah. I love what our friend Toby says. He says, Toby, or Toby says, nature always bats last. Hmm. You know, so wow. the, the, yeah, the quicker that we get to a place where we understand – that we can't overpower nature and yeah. you know yeah the, i think the better off we are i i use this metaphor 
How many of you all out there have tubed down, you know, gone tubing down a river? And, you know, a lot of times the people, you know, the people in, in the audience, you know, they raise their hands. They've gone tubing before. And I say, well, nature is like us tubers. You know, we go, to, we start at the top of the river and we, you know, float down river. And humans are, we, we like to do things differently. So what we do is we start at the bottom of the river and try like mad to get to the top of the river against, yeah. against, against all the, the stream and, right. and flow, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just do me a favor and, and tell everybody, just spend a minute or two on what a permaculture design course is. We just finished our permaculture design course here in Phoenix. Can you tell us a little bit about what they are and so on and so on? Yes, love to. So the, the permaculture design course is a global class that no matter where you are, it will be almost exactly the same. If you mm -hmm. take a course in Africa or India or Pakistan or anywhere like that, the, the permaculture design course is based on the first 10 chapters of Bill Mollison's Permaculture Designer's Manual, mm -hmm. and it's a 72-hour structured course, so it's at least 72 hours of uh, in-class instruction plus hands-on. So where you are, it, there might be different offerings. There might be a f two weeks total mm -hmm. intensive. You go to mm -hmm. one place on the planet, you stay there for two weeks, you live, breathe, sleep, eat permaculture for those two weeks. And, and that's what I did when I first took my course in 03. Mm -hmm. Now the, there's a couple of other uh, examples. There's the there's the weekend base, and so that might be every other weekend, or every third weekend, or one weekend a month. Yeah. So no no matter what, there are various ways that any almost anybody can take the course and then apply that to their life. Yeah. In a in cool. a very meaningful way. Yeah. So if you're interested in a permaculture design course in your area, what I suggest that people do is they type in permaculture design course and the name of your town or the biggest town near you and see what comes up. And you might very well be surprised that there's one right around the corner from you. So, and it's a, you know, it's a good, like Don said, it's 72 hours. So it's a nice deep dive into permaculture and permaculture concepts and, you know, it, it's one of those courses that quite often you you do learn a lot, but quite often you end up with more questions in the end, <laughs> right? I know I did. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Man, I, I spent the first two weekends of my permaculture design course saying, oh my gosh, this is yeah. what I have been looking for forever. So Yeah, yeah. Ditto you know. that, man. I, I yeah. was right there with you. So yep. in Toby's class... We talked in week seven. He talked about placemaking uh, and communities, and one of the big topics in that is invisible structures. Uh, yeah. So, and that's you know, it's a really, really important, over, often overlooked piece of permaculture and permaculture design is the invisible structures, and they can be very powerful. So, would you mind sharing with people what that is and how impactful it could be? Yes. Love to. So let's stick first with structure. So let's okay. think of the house. You know, it's a tangible, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can see it, you can live in it. It, you know, it's, it, it has a form of protection. Mm -hmm. Now think of something that you probably or probably have. You, you have car insurance. Mm. Car insurance is <laughs> a structure. It covers you, pun intended, mm -hmm. uh, for any difficulties that you might have. Or if your windshield uh, breaks, you can get it replaced. Or you mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately hit something, it covers you and doesn't land you in jail because you can't pay the bill. Yeah. So th there's, a, there's a visible structure, the house, and an invisible structure, which is uh -huh. like an insurance of some description, a life insurance, a car insurance, something mm -hmm. like that. 
Yeah. Trust funds are invisible structures. Oh yeah. LLCs are invisible structures. We we live and breathe invisible structures everywhere. Yeah. And yet they're not emphasized as much as oh we're going to be doing some gardening today. Yeah. Exactly. Well, one of the powerful invisible structures that surrounds our properties are this, you know, and back when I was in school 15 years ago, in urban planning school at ASU, we called them a bundle of sticks. Uh, they're, the, <laughs> they're the rights. They're the rights that come along with your property. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you may have water rights yeah. and they're the the rules or the laws that you have to you know, play by in your neighborhood. If you live in an HOA, yeah. a homeowners association, you know, a buddy of mine lives in a homeowners association and he is not allowed to grow food in his yard here in the valley. You know, yeah. invisible structure, you know, and that's that's something yeah. you need to pay attention to going in. You know. Yeah, it can it, it can definitely harm you or or yeah. enhance you. You know, there's yeah. there's you know, there's lots of ways, yes. For sure. I want to I want to bring in Mollison again because Mollison was a, you know was a fantastic teacher and part of his teachings was okay he says now let's take this piece of land what are we going to do with this piece of land well let's look at the land with our permaculture eyes and see what the land offers us mm -hmm. and then we can figure out how many people can live on the land and be supported by the land. So let's make let's let's see what we can put here. We can mm -hmm. we can put we can put some cattle out here. We can put some ducks in a pond out here. We can harvest trees. We got uh, all these different resources. Uh, we have all these different skills. So let's set up a mechanic shop. Let's set up a community center. Let's set up, uh, you know, a, a big barn to do our food processing. Let's make sure we got individual houses so we mm -hmm. have our own space. And let's see how many people we can support on the land. And then let's put the land in a trust and put the businesses in a in a corporation and protect everything with visible and invisible structures. Mm -hmm. So I I, lo I love thinking of, on from you know from the back end to the front end. You know, mm -hmm. everyone goes in and say, "Oh, I'm going to put this here and I'm going to put that there because you know that's the thing to do." Well, maybe the land can't support that, and then it would be unsustainable. Yeah, and it would not be a sustainable human settlement, as in the description I gave in the beginning. Got it. And Bill Mullison's description, right? Mm. How does one discover these invisible structures? You know, like when you even even before you, you know, actually go to purchase a house. How does one discover these these invisible structures? And in... guess you would start with the county recorder's office. Mm -hmm. So you would see, you know, what, what your parcel number is. You can you can view that out. You can see what the county, and then then you go to the city records, and then you mm -hmm. find out what the city is doing. So I have the city of Mesa. You have the city of Phoenix. Phoenix, yep. So, so you know, each one of those has some different criteria on what you can and can't do. Uh, and then, like you said before, you know, a community might be in a in a HOA situation, and then mm -hmm. you get. So each one of those would be like different layers. So you would you would look at the the, the state, county, city. And then community HOA, yeah, an HOA, yeah, yeah. right. That the HOA would be a community uh, rules and regs. Mm -hmm. So you know, with each one of those, then you can determine whether or not you want to live there or not, and that would determine what you can and cannot do under the laws and guidelines set by institutions around the area where you're living or wish to live. Yeah. 
so that yes that would be important and then i would you know then i would start to do my analysis i would go in do a site analysis sector analysis then i would be doing those things coming mm-hmm. in after that because once i know what i can or cannot do that gives me my template for me to be able to come in and say yes well this is this is conducive to what i wish to do on my property uh-huh. mm-hmm. uh, and or no, this is not the property for me, I'm going to look elsewhere. One of the invisible structures that I highly, highly recommend that people look at before they even think about buying a place, you know, so you found the place before you think about buying it is what was on that land before you? We have a lot, we have a lot of old farmland that gets converted to homes here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And, you know, that farmland comes with decades and decades of pollutants on it. Absolutely. You know, not, not and, just not just the pollutants from like pesticides and herbicides, but also from the salt in our area. Oh, in yeah. any arid region, there, yeah. whenever you put water down on the surface, there's evaporation and it leaves the salt behind. And nine times out of ten, the reason why the farmer has to sell the land is because he can't grow food, can't on, grow there food on it anymore yeah so that's you know that's a really really important piece to look at is you know what is the history of your property oh and, and another one is what's near the property you know people yeah. you know there's, there's there's we're a farming community of sorts here in phoenix that's how it started many many decades ago and you know a friend of mine owns a big egg production facility and you know it, the it had been there for decades and then all of a sudden the neighbors were complaining but they chose to move next to it nor near it yeah you know when they bought the place so who's you know whose responsibility is that does the egg farmer need to move or right. do, you know does somebody take responsibility for making the decision to move next to some kind of smelly facility yeah right you know? so yeah. Yeah. We. Well, I mean, not too long ago, we had people complaining about a compost facility. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like exactly. Wait, you, you're you're going to complain about sweet smelling compost? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. There you go. All right. In week six, I'm uh, we're going backwards yeah. now into week six. Livelihood, real wealth, and becoming valuable. And this right. is you know often one of those things that's overlooked is this notion of you know how do you how do you produce more value for yourself you want what are your thoughts on that don well it starts in your head yeah so when when you get that put, get together then mm-hmm. the, everything else is going to fall into place because the law of attraction yeah will kick right in and the 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 money will follow the mind uh-huh but it's not just that one thing. Real wealth. Real wealth says to me, okay, so I'm valuing myself for what I do, for what I know, for whom I know, from what I am doing for the planet and, mm-hmm. and different things. But it's also about, you know, am I going to be having to work 80 hours, not have time to myself or my family, mm-hmm. Just to earn these, you know, uh, six-figure incomes, is that real wealth or is that something else? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking at ways to reduce the amount of hours and time that I work, and still yet be have a comfortable put organic food on my table every day. You know, live a good life. Mm-hmm but not necessarily with a high income. Yeah. One of the one of the things I've spent the last couple of decades doing for myself is getting really frugal with what I spend every month. Now I don't, you know, I I live a a well-lived life and you know, we eat well here and and you know, I live in a nice home. And, you know, I've really concentrated over time, though, on reducing my debt, making sure that I, you know, reduce or eliminate the debt. But also, you know, I don't spend big, you know, so I don't have a new car every, 
uh, you know, every other year. I'm currently right. driving a, you know, a vehicle that I love absolutely, which is a 1985 Toyota pickup truck, which I spent nine thousand dollars on last year to refurbish. You know, because it's still got right. a lot of life into in it. So that's one of the ways that I've done it. That I've, you know, I've reduced my need to earn. Yes. Yeah. So that I don't have to work so much and so hard. Yes. And that, you know, that's funny coming out of me, not work so hard. I work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but when it's when it's your when it's your passion, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not really work, is it? it yeah. It's, it, some of it is like, you know, I can come out of a permaculture design course class and I'm more more alive, more inspired, more energized at the end of the, you know, a long day. Yeah by you know sharing sharing what i know yeah. i mean and i get paid for it it's like yeah. oh man this is great yeah today i spent half of the day you know a good 5 hours building a chicken coop in the backyard you know about 6 months ago we lost some hens to a bobcat right in the middle of phoenix arizona wow. um, which shocked us i've been keeping hens here for 15 years and never had a problem and you know, so I'm I'm building the Fort Knox of chicken coops, and I was I was <laughs> and I was working on the gates back there today, and just thinking, oh my gosh, what a great life I have! I you know I get to work from home, and by design, I get to work from home, and you know, and then I get to you know when it's important to be out in the yard, getting my hands dirty, you know, building stuff and gardening, I get to do that too. So, yeah, sweet livelihood, wealth and valuing self i mean that's a, many times a lot of people say you know when if you're giving to others you mm -hmm. have a much more inspired much more fulfilled life mm -hmm. than by just you know working 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 for self and or for you know a, a company but yeah. when you're out there, you know, giving, you're sharing, you're, you know, you're improving other people, you know, that that's becoming valuable right there for yeah. me. Yeah. And I, I also want to address in this part, and I, I may have said this in the scope of this course, that I, I have, and I've, I've been looking at this whole notion of sustainability and permaculture for decades. And... What I have discovered for myself is that there is only one place that lack lives on the planet. Mm. Uh, yep. And yeah, because when I look at nature, you know, there's there's an amazing amount. If I go, if I were to go dig Jerusalem artichokes in my backyard right now, I'll bet you I could dig out a hundred pounds of them. Wow. You know, out of our backyard, and. They just, you know, they just grow wild in my backyard every year. And so the, this no, this notion is is that the only place that lack lives is between our ears. Uh-huh. So lack yeah. is a is a human imposed condition that you can either buy into or not. Yeah, you know. That's yeah. you know that that'll that'll give you some perspective into wealth. Mm. So in in this topic, um, uh -huh. there is you know buying local. Oh yeah, big time. Right, buying local, supporting local businesses. We have like a, on Facebook page, you know, desert marketplace where you can mm -hmm. post your produce, extra produce, or oh, yeah. whatever you want in to sell. You can put it on free cycle and just put the a, a bucket load of uh, fruit out by the street and say, hey. Come and get this. I don't want it to go to waste. Yeah, you know these these are the things that really bring me back to the ethics of permaculture. Mm -hmm. And the way I say it, not everyone says it says it this way, but I say care mm -hmm. of the earth, care of people, care of the future. Mm -hmm. Now, in care of the future, this is where Mollison would say, you know, share whatever is the surplus of caring for the earth and caring for people mm -hmm. and share the surplus and also limit the population. So that's what Bill Morrison said. 
So I've kind of synergized that uh, after years of mulling over and over in my head saying, okay, how can I come up with three things that sound similar that people can remember and they might be able to grasp? I term those three together mm-hmm. by putting the care of the future at the end because mm. I feel it's all inclusive. Yeah. So think yeah. about, you know, the uh, Confederacy of the Iroquois uh, coordination, you know, the seven generations. You know, mm-hmm. If I make a decision, if I'm going to plant a tree, and I'm going to say, I'm putting that tree there. But then I say, oh, wait a minute, what about care of the future? Is that tree going to be detrimental to my home or my neighbor's home? Is that tree going to you know, be a lightning rod? Is that tree going to produce so much litter? The HOA tells me to get out of town. You know, there's all these things related to the decision to plant a tree. Yeah. My favorite one with all of that is, are you planting them underneath power lines? Uh And then, you know, and then the power company comes in and cuts a big V out of your tree because Because they can't have it growing near your power lines, right? Yeah, I've I've seen that so many times. Yeah. 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 uh, Yeah. So so it's something to think about. So that the livelihood and the real wealth and becoming valuable. These are mm-hmm. these are things that are kind of built on the previous one, the invisible structures mm-hmm. that we just talked about and creating numerous and varied ways of living a full and dynamic life without yeah. necessarily having to go out and make a bunch of money yeah. to do that. You can do it by, like you say, decreasing your need and Mm -hmm. then you know harvesting or gleaning for i mean there's like you said there's food everywhere yeah not necessarily in the supermarket yeah why why don't we just go and pick it up or trade or you know oh my gosh uh, yeah yeah so i i it's 1991 so we're going to transport back 25 years and a buddy of mine my, a buddy of mine just got back from a two-week sailing trip in the South Pacific. Right. And so this was this was one of those moments in life that make you pause, made me pause, and it's like I will remember it for my life. Mm. This is a half a lifetime ago that this happened for me, right? Ah. So he's he's on this sailboat, and they they you know throw anchor in, in this small town in the South Pacific somewhere. And they go into this little town looking for food, right? Or when they were really they were looking for a grocery store, and uh-huh. the the people in the town said, <laughs> "Go pick your own." <laughs> <laughs> wow! Oh, yeah. said, I go, saw that go. one coming. Yeah, they said, "Go pick your own." It's like, right? Wow. And that, you yeah. know, that was one of those pivotal moments in my life, you know? Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. Pointing that's... to the field. Go pick your own. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Amazing. Exactly. So. Yeah. So in week five, we're going to go back another week. Energy solution for homes and communities. Okay. And I, I want to I touch on something that you just recently did to your house. Yes. Um, you put a metal roof on your house, and I, 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 so I have metal roof envy at this point. <laughs> well, I, I know a man. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you do. I'll bet you yeah. do. I, I have a quick question. Did they have to yes. take your air conditioning unit off of your house to put the roof down? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. So tell people why – what was your thought process? Why would you spend – well, you know, roofs are expensive these days, but what yours was about 15000 Uh No, uh, those were the ones that I turned down. Ah, uh, when, yeah. I, when I did a little bit of research, I found that the, the, the national going rate was about $6 a square foot. Oh, all right, cool. So for my space, that would amount to about 12000 oh, So that right, was my cool. target figure. Uh-huh. Now, it seemed like a lot, but when I thought about it, and I'm telling you my thought process here yeah, was please. that metal roof 
it's good for the next 40, 50 years. Uh huh. And if I went back to asphalt roof, you know, that would be two or three roofs. Yep. And so I would years. actually, I would actually spend more money on keep replacing the asphalt roof, and I wouldn't be able to harvest my water from it, which right. was a deal killer. Yeah. So I I went for the standing seam metal roof, and it's beautiful. I love nice. it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Nice. It's called aged copper, so it's like a light green. Cool. It is actually a Energy Star rated appliance. That's where, that's where I was going next because this is week five was about energy solutions for yeah. homes and communities. So yeah. tell me, tell me the reasoning behind it was so you could, so you could. Uh, harvest your rainwater, potable rainwater. Yes, yes and potable energy rainwater star. right off the roof. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about the Energy Star thing. Now, the Energy Star aspect of it is is where the where the roofs are, where the paint, the semi gloss paint is baked onto metal sheets of uh, roofing material, metal panels. They're 16 inches wide by however long is necessary for your sections of your roof so mm-hmm. i had majority of my roof section was 16 feet by 16 inches mm-hmm. so each one of the big huge panels were uh, adapted to the space and anchored in place panel by panel it was really neat now because it has like a semi gloss kind of finish to it and it's baked on so that's one of the reasons why it lasts for so many years it it does reflect the sun oh, rays yeah. and the heat from even getting into the attic so if you can keep the attic cooler and then put a blanket over your ceiling like a nice deep layer of insulation which is what I have now I took out uh-huh. the old I don't even want to say the name anymore, <laughs> fiber class insulation, which was pretty pathetic. Right. And now I have 10 to 12 inches of the green fiber, yeah, which is basically a treated shredded paper, a cellulose fiber mix. And so now that's, that's, I've reduced the amount of heat going into the attic. I've reduced uh-huh. the the heat going into the home from the attic, and I've and I've increased the amount of heat or cool I keep in the house. Ah, right. So for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that I get calls every every month. I get a call from a solar installation company saying we can save you money. I said, No, you can't. Said, yes, <laughs> right, I can. Exactly. I said, No, you can't. I said. Uh, I've done all these things, and and my electricity bill is less than ninety dollars every month. Uh huh. And that's what I pay for a twelve hundred square foot home. Yeah. In Phoenix, Arizona, that's amazing. In it, yes, we're yeah. one hundred and twenty degrees in June, and we we had you know over one hundred and ten for you know thirty days or whatever it was. It was right. Yeah, another hot time. So it's really important to create that insulated envelope. Right. Even right. if you have to retrofit, and, and, and I call it outsulating. Oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but that's not the only thing that helps me to, to save a bunch of money. Because, you know, the less I spend, the more I save. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I have a lot of shading. I have a big shade trees around my home, especially on the west and northwest areas of my home site. I have shade cloth uh, that's up and down temporarily, depending on the time of year. I not only have a, uh, well, I have a brand new air conditioning heat pump thing now. That'll help too, um, yeah. Yeah, that's happening. But I also have an evaporative cooler. Now, I know a lot of people think that's old school, and I will agree it's old school, but <laughs> I want to tell you, it's fantastic yeah. in April and May and June, June. and yeah. again in October, you know, the, nothing beats, you know, that when the air is so dry around, the evap cooler works fantastic, and then yeah. I use the AC like everybody else when the mm-hmm. monsoons arrive in the summer. Right. 
So the swamp cooler or evaporative cooler is what that is. Yeah. It uses water too. Yeah. By the by the way, a side note, I just had a new one installed on the roof today. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean they're great. I mean if you want to save money and be, and care for the environment, you know the evap coolers are definitely a way to go. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so talking water week four. Yes. We'll talk water for about 10 minutes, although you can probably talk hours on water. <laughs> um, yes. Water, water wis- wisdom. So reducing our water bill through right. what in your yard? Yeah. So tell, us about, comes, tell us about your water. Well, first, this comes back to the whole point of taking a permaculture design course. Uh-huh. It is all about the design. Mm, yes. And and it is about the 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 conscious choice of what it is that you plant and where you plant it. Mm-hmm. So anytime you want to bring in a non-native tree, plant, shrub, whatever it is, those things need to be closer to the sources of water, close to your roof oh, yes. edges, closer into your home. The desert plants here are on our periphery, and then the exotic plants are closer to the house, yeah. and th- those are the ones that are fed by the gray water, by the rainwater, and and by uh, whatever other sources of water you have. Yeah. Now you can take it to the the mathematical nth degree and do all the calculations. You know, X tree needs X number, uh, X Y and Z number of gallons of water per year, you know, staggered out throughout the year, but you know, that's that's not my idea of fun. So I generally yeah. don't do too much of that. I do I'm more of the experimenter. Yep. And like many gardeners, you know, we kind of experiment, ooh, that looks like a good place for thus <laughs> and such and I'll right. stick it in there and see what does. And if it thrives, it stays. If it doesn't I might move it somewhere else, or I might let it go and try with something else. Yeah. So, but everything comes back to that to the design, the design. and it's yeah. it's in the permaculture design course that you learn about the placement, appropriate placement, and creating guilds, so that each element of a of a guild design supports the other. And so a tree that's that's planted alone by itself in the middle of the yard somewhere would probably wither up and die. But if you put a bunch of stuff around it that's conducive to its health, it's going to thrive. Yeah. So it's how and where and why. Mm-hmm. In the reducing our water bills and the burden that we put on the infrastructure yeah. like uh, the sewers and the reservoirs. Yeah. So all of that looks at, looks at all of that. So um what yeah, so, so rainwater, and, gray water. Yep. And what is gray water? <clears throat> gray water is used tap water. Mm. It's tap water that we've done our dishes or had a shower in or you know or or some or bath water or something like that. It can be part of your washing machine water Laundry. as long as yep. it's not so as long as it's not black, you know, you you can't you can't wash your dirty cloth diapers. You no, know, that has oh, to yeah. go back in the sewer. Yep. But you can do all the other clothing because that can just go right outside and be yeah. perfectly fine underneath a citrus tree or you know any other you know tropical type you know bananas love all that stuff you know all of those yeah, things exactly. Exactly. So yeah. that was rain. Uh, that was gray water. Black gray water, water is black water is basically toilet and kitchen sink water. Yeah, technically. They, yep. Technically. Yes. And uh, and then rainwater is any water that falls on your property. And one of my favorite discoveries of the past five years is storm water, and that's yeah. you know capturing water that is. Uh, falls elsewhere and runs by your house. You know, right, there's, right, there's down the street, methods. yeah. Down the street, there's different methods of, of yeah. uh, r- temporarily redirecting it to, you know, to water street trees. Yeah, the cutout, Brad Lancaster, the yeah. author of the uh, Rainwater Harvesting For Bible. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he you know, he he devised some ideas and you know, in the middle of the night, he and his brother went out with their <laughs> with their <laughs> saw uh, and cut a little notch in the in the curbing and lowered the bed that was next to the curb because the sidewalk was offset. So there's this mm-hmm. 6 8 foot space between the curb and the sidewalk which is offset from that. And so he had this space where he could be planting all these native trees to create shade and have a nice avenue, what I know as an avenue. An avenue is a street with trees on both sides, right. and they, they, the trees actually meet together in the middle of the street, and you have a nice, cool, <laughs> refreshing, leisurely stroll in the middle yeah. of the day without you know cooking yourself. So right. and that's not my idea of an avenue. So yeah. as because you know I, I do come from England, so sycamores are used a lot for that kind of thing on the sides of streets. Oh right, yeah, all the way yeah, through exactly. London, the London Plain. Uh, that's the type of sycamore or sycamore-like tree. Right. Phoenix is actually like wanting to get what, what did oh, they I say? Twenty-five percent coverage was that coverage right? by twenty twenty-five? Something crazy like that. Yeah. Crazy wonderful yeah. like that. Not bad. Well, it's it's a good start. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Boy, I have some stories about that. I'm going to stop yeah. you here for a moment. I'm going to stop you here yes. for a moment. Mayor out there, M A H E R, in Pine, Arizona, is on, and he shot me. He, she, sorry, I can't tell yes. gender there. Sent me a question. Says I am an engineer who designs on-site water wastewater design for single-family residential. And yes. I don't understand your question, so if you could clarify it, I'll just say it. And uh, the question is: Is there specific permaculture that can be added to the disposal field that is not necessarily edible? So I'm I'm wondering if there's a wrong word. Is there a specific plant that can be added to disposal fields? Maybe that's what I think they're she's asking. talking about. The leach field. Yeah, the leach field. Right. Um, Any hungry trees. Yeah. So I mean, it, it'd be it'd be perfect to be able to plant a bunch of fruit trees around. I mean, that that would be good, but not necessarily in that region. It might they might. I mean, you could put apple trees, and but they might yep. you know the, the blossoms might freeze and you and you you might lose them. But you know, there's there's other trees that are bigger leaves, mm-hmm. uh, bigger bigger canopies. Those yeah. are the ones that require more water and more nutrients, so you can you can choose that way and create a shady space and you know have the leach field underneath, but then have you know a nice little like family gathering place yeah. above it. Yeah. So I the next door neighbors, I live in an old area of Phoenix, and there used to be septic tanks and leach fields. Oh, yeah. You know, here before we got on sewer. Right. Probably in the you know in the early '60s, and I planted a fruit tree in my neighbor's yard. And this fruit tree, I swear, you could watch the <laughs> thing grow. And what we later determined was that we planted it right on the old uh, you know sewer leach field, and it's just yeah. you know it went from a one inch diameter tree to a five inch diameter tree in like three years. Wow, it was amazing. So yeah, those those are the kinds of things you want to look for if you have that. Fruit trees uh, are a great thing to put in uh-huh. that space. Uh-huh. Yeah. When I when I went to Quail Springs near Santa Barbara, California, for one of my classes, uh-huh. one of the strategies that they were doing, they had their master plan, their master permaculture plan. They knew what they was needing to do, and they was in the process of installing their permaculture design. And so they knew exactly where all the trees needed to be planted. So before they planted the trees, they put in the fertilizer. So they Ooh. dug like a three foot by three foot and like five foot deep hole. Uh-huh. And they put the composting toilet over the top. Oh. So everyone used the the, the toilet, you know, and as, as the manure built uh-huh. up inside... Mm-hmm. to within about you know two feet from the top then they move the the uh, structure <laughs> over to the next tree hole put dirt in on the other one and planted mm-hmm. the tree mm. 
So it was it was pre-fertilized. I mean, <laughs> so you know, talk about planting uh, for resilience. Oh yeah. Uh, it's like you know, f- first plant the water, then plant the plant. Yeah. In in an arid situation, so you know here they're planting the manure first, and mm-hmm. then the tree, and then and, and with the water. Yeah. So you know it's it's this is this is what makes permaculture so more dynamic and so more interesting and so more sustainable. Yeah. Than 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 any other form of design that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Cool. So yes. why don't you tell people give give people a tour of your rainwater garden at your house, the rainwater harvesting of your house. Just tell us what do you what do you have going on? Because you got multiple different ways. Well, that you're doing yeah, interesting. It. You should ask ask that question because you know I just put my new roof on. Right. <laughs> I'm adapting to my new circumstances. So one of the things that I decided to do was I decided to to, to completely demolish a false facade, a false peak on my roof. Mm, it was completely, mm. you know, completely just ornamental. It was there was no function to it other than, you know, it was just there. So I decided yeah. to get rid of that because I wanted a nice clean line all the way across the front south facing. Uh, uh, ridge of uh, area of my of my uh, roof, mm-hmm. and so now I'm having to change the positions of the guttering, and um, so I have several uh, several areas of guttering um, where I'm just simply redirecting the water. So mm-hmm. the, my whole house is not guttered. Ah. It only has gutter where I need it across the driveway to move it away oh. from the back of the house into a container so it goes directly to the the apple tree. Mm-hmm. Every, again, everything's connected. Yeah. So, you know, from the peak of the house to the gutter to the container to the hoses that, that water the trees or whatever it's going to be, there's this connections, beneficial connections one to the other. Mm-hmm. So I have micro basins. Now, you know, oh, HO, HOA compliant, you know, you can put all kinds of earth tanks. So the first place to store the water is in the earth itself. The only reason you need a container above the ground is so that you have water to use in between rain events. Mm-hmm. So there's no need to spend lots of money on a fancy, you know, cistern or something right. like that when you already have the earth and you just need to redirect the water to where it's needed the most. Uh-huh. For the most part, exotic trees, things that yeah. will give you food and and uh, and, and other attributes. So, it's so a, I have the gutters, I have the containers, I have the yeah. earth tanks, but I also have some other things. I had a problem right and one of the things i love the problem is the solution Mm -hmm. so my home site lot has a conjoined fence in the very back Mm -hmm. and so the whole lot when it was graded by the builder is graded from that uh, communal fence in the back and there's about a six to eight inch drop from the fence to the street so had I not intercepted the water, the water would flow from that back fence all the way to the street, and I would lose it all. Mm. So I, I designed a way to intercept the water by simply by creating a 4-inch by 8-inch trench where I put in a perforated flexible hose in the bottom of the trench and then put large decomposed granite like rock on on top so now when the water flows as it has been downhill from the fence towards my house it is intercepted into the perforated pipe oh, and then i nice. have it and then i have it redirected back the other way from whence it came 
to a what they call a French chimney. So the trench is called a French drain. A rock filled mm-hmm. trench is a French drain. And I, I gathered the water there. I turned it around in a transfer solid pipe. And then I put it into a French chimney, which is basically, if you were digging a post hole, like mm-hmm. about 12 inches around, 12 inches across diameter, and about three feet deep. Right. You know, a good, a good solid house-like f- post hole. And then I put a perforated pipe in the middle and put rock all the way around. So now I'm... So I'm taking the water from the intercept trench, putting it into a transfer pipe, and then putting it into the deep chimney, the French chimney, which right. is right next to the tree. So in this cool. area that's the approximately 30 feet by 60 feet, uh-huh. I, I am concentrating the water to five trees by gathering it over the whole area. Nice. That's design. You're talking about a, a well thought out design. Yeah, and yeah, engineered, right? Right. But but real basic engineering skills. We're not talking about a whole lot here. We're not talking about right. you know laser levels even. You know, I did it with just you know a, a bubble line and you know simple stuff. Yeah. Simple stuff. It's you know it's not yeah. It's it's pretty simple and it and it's worked like a champ for like I mean I again I this is this is permaculture you design it you build it you walk away and let it work yeah. for you right so I have a passive rainwater harvesting machine mm-hmm. whether I'm there at home or away it's going to work yeah and I'm That's- not Right. That's a bit, you know, I have a uh, rainwater harvesting cistern here. It's 750 gallons. You remember when we put it in, what, 11 or 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was $1,500 to put it in. And, yeah. you know, quite honestly, it doesn't get used as much as I would like because in order to make it work, I have to do something. Yeah. You know, and then we have the other side of the, you know, of the patio. Of the patio. And... Mm-hmm. On the other side of the patio, I have an $80 rainwater harvesting system. It's very passive. I do – I clean off the screen a couple of times a year. Yeah. That's all I have to do, and it just works. Yeah. So. That's nice. I, I, yeah. Those are the things I love. Is, is, yeah. And the more and more of those uh, passive regenerative systems you mm-hmm. have – the the more resilient and sustainable your home site and your lifestyle will be. Yeah. And it's it's a matter of thinking about the future and about how much do I want to put into this? What's my return on my investment thinking about capital expenditure? Setting up the structures visible and invisible and then building the thing and then watching it work. Yeah. I'm watching it work. And the other thing is you, you, you'll you tweak things. Yeah. You know. The, well, there's the, that. <laughs> yeah. I'm out in my umbrella and my Wellington boots and my camera and, I, and my shovel in the other hand. And I'm yeah. out there tweaking the system here and there a little bit because it's such fun. Yeah. You know, it just, yeah. I, I kind of, yeah, I can't leave it alone. I got to. Right. I gotta make sure it's working. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I watched after we installed this uh, rainwater harvesting tank. I watched it fill in 15 minutes. I actually went out in the rain, stood up at the t- on a ladder, and I watched the thing fill up. So I yes, you know, I, yes. Now that's return on investment, man. That is return on investment, man. <laughs> so. You know, in the long term, you've, you've uh-huh. figured out that it's not as appropriate yes. as you first thought. Yeah. And, you know, those are one of the lessons. Yeah, exactly. So any last thoughts before we sign off? I, I was checking to see if there was any questions from people, and there are not. Okay. So any last thoughts that you have about permaculture and so on and so on? Well, read a book, go on yeah. YouTube, take a class, take a course. <laughs> 
Don't stop learning. Um, just start to incorporate some of these things in your life and start to see things shift in your life. Yeah. Beautiful. And be patient with nature. Be patient with yeah, ourselves. Yeah, go with, go with nature. Yeah. Go with nature, yeah. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, thank you very much for joining us on the call tonight, Don. I appreciate it. Yeah. You're and, welcome. Um, I had fun. I love doing yeah. it. Oh, I hear you, man. And we will talk <laughs> soon. Have a great week and great holiday and talk to you later. Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast but don't have time to listen to everyone, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.